Okay, so personally I blame law school for this particular problem. That's okay, it's not a problem that's particularly difficult to solve, but it is something you need to actually give some attention to and turn your minds to if you are going to move beyond simply producing work that looks like a law student produced it. My name's Chris Hargraves, I'm from tipsalawyers.com and today we are talking about writing a letter of advice. And specifically, we're talking about writing a letter of advice as distinct from writing a research memo, which is a fundamentally different product. The problem is a lot of letters of advice look very much like they're just a research memo. So what is the difference? How do we go about doing things? And why is this problem existing in the first place? When you went to law school, if you're a, say, a law student still, maybe you're a clerk or a graduate or a junior lawyer, most of the writing you have done has taken place during law school, correct? Yes, let's just go with yes, even if that's not necessarily true. We are looking at a system where you have learned what law school is actually wanting from you in order to get particular grades. That is very different. That is a different purpose from what a client wants from you in the real world. What do I mean? When you're at law school, you are typically taught this system that you are required to then sort of blurt out on paper as part of your answers which allows for the lecturer or the professor or whatever you uh, call them in whatever country you're from to conclude that you have actually absorbed the material, you know what you're doing and you can apply that to a particular circumstance. So as a general rule, you are presented with a question. You are required to list the relevant facts or at least distill the relevant facts from those that are perhaps irrelevant. You are then required to state the applicable laws. So are you talking about contract? Are you talking about torts? Are you talking about equity in some fashion? What are the applicable laws to this particular scenario? Usually a dead giveaway is what subject are you being assessed on? And then once you have said what the applicable laws are, you apply the facts to the law as the next section. So we've got three whole sections at the moment and we haven't given anyone an answer about anything. And then once you have applied things, hopefully you don't have to sit on the fence and you can actually come up with a conclusion. Although often the conclusion is, oh, maybe this side, maybe that side, it could go either way. And then you state the answer. This tends to then translate into the way a lot of law students and graduates do things when they get to legal practice because that's what they've learned, that's what they've been taught. And so if you are given a job to do where you are asked to actually prepare an advice for a client, you go through that process. And this is where the problem starts. You have been asked to write an advice and what you do is write your research memo. It may well be that all of the things I just listed are actually required in order to get to the answer that you want to deliver to the client. But that doesn't automatically mean that you have to communicate all those things to the client. And this is the fundamental disconnect between writing a letter of advice and writing a research memo. A research memo is your thought process documented down so other people can check it by which you arrived at the conclusion for the question that was put to you. Perhaps you decided the question was a bad question and someone should be asking a different question. Perhaps you decided there was a clear answer. Perhaps you decided we needed more information. Whatever the case may be, that is what your research memo has allowed you to do. Now, I'm not saying that documenting those things is bad. I'm saying that that doesn't necessarily form the letter or the way you communicate that advice to your client. Why do I say that? Because many clients couldn't give a stuff about the process by which you arrived at the answer. After all, at the end of the day, many clients, I won't say all, we're gonna come back to this in a second, many clients just want the answer to the question. That's their fundamental desired outcome is the answer to the question. Now, as a general rule, that's all they care about. Now. Why then do we not simply give them the answer in all occasions? Well, there are a few reasons we might go into a bit more detail. So we might, for example, have an institutional or sophisticated client who actually wants to see the detail and will read it in full and will digest it and will ensure that the things you have set out align with their existing thought process. 
You might be doing work for someone who is say a general counsel or in-house counsel. You might be doing work for someone who is a professional themselves and they want to be sure that what you have done aligns with a correct assessment of things and they don't have additional questions or thoughts or what about this, what about that, that sort of thing. So there are purposes and audiences for which you might include potentially even all of that information. Now, that said, I know very few clients who care to pay money to their lawyers to write down a list of the documents that their clients have given them or to write down a chronology of the things that their client has already told them or to regurgitate back to their client the facts and circumstances that the client spent the time telling them in the first place, okay? The client already knows the facts of their case because it's their case and they told them to you in the first place. So personally, I would be a little bit concerned to spend a thousand dollars for you to write down the things that I already spent time telling you. That's not every client though, because maybe you had to discard a bunch of stuff as irrelevant, or maybe you had to question mark some stuff. We do have a few ethical conundrums because maybe we have to say, look, this particular fact is key to the answer. And if this fact turns out not to be right, then the whole answer changes. And so you need to be confident in this particular fact as you told it. That would be a relevant and important time to make that clear to the client. But you don't need to set out all of the information. Do you need to really tell the client the name of their own company? Do you need to tell them that they're trading as a sole trader or they're trading through a corporate entity? Do you need to tell them who the other side is or something like that? No, you don't need to set out all of the facts. You need to set out the relevant and critical facts for the advice. And maybe you don't even need to do that at all. If there's nothing particularly controversial or difficult, then you can possibly even skip that entire section. So I guess the main point then that I'm trying to make is you need to consider who your client is and what they actually need in order for this advice to be valuable to them. At the end of the day, of course, you are going to deliver a bill. And this is where a big sort of worry comes up and the lawyers go, oh, this was a really easy answer, but it took us $10,000 to arrive at this fairly simple to express answer. And if we just give them that answer and then we send them a $10,000 bill, there's going to be this perceived disconnect between the value of the advice because it seems very short and the effort that we actually put in in arriving at that advice. Now, I have to be perfectly honest, I wish that was not true, but it probably is a little bit true. There are some clients who will understand that you have given them a very succinct advice and they will appreciate that and they will pay the bill and it won't matter. And there will other, be others who go, well, hang on, if it was that simple, why am I paying you so much money associated with arriving at this relatively simple to express answer? And that is a problem with communication that is a problem with expectations, and that is a problem with you understanding your clients a little bit better. So, main takeaway from this video is that some clients have different desires from other clients, but you need to create a distinction in your brain between a research memo and a letter of advice. The research memo is the process you undertake to arrive at the answer. The letter of advice is what you actually need to communicate to your client in order to ensure that they get the outcomes of that research, but perhaps communicated in a slightly or even very different way. These are different things, and the earlier you can understand that and start applying it and adapting it, the better you will find yourself and the better relationships you will develop with your clients, and the more receptive your clients will be to your advices. Final tip, even though that was sort of the conclusion to the video, I forgot to say this bit earlier, so this counts as a bonus. There is enormous value in the concept of an executive summary at the start of an advice. Sometimes you might feel that you cannot get around setting out these things that need to be set out for whatever reason, one of the things we've already spoken about. If you have to do that, what if you just put in a short summary of the advice at the front for the top page readers, you're sending it to a corporate entity, say, you know it's gonna be read by a dozen different people. Some of them just want the answer, the others wanna read through the whole thing cater to both needs, okay? The executive summary is a wonderful way of doing that. Here was the questions we were asked, here are the answers to those questions. Read on for the full details if you wanna do so. That's the way to consider the audience when you're actually preparing an advice. That is my strong suggestion for producing advices that your clients are going to read. This video is now long enough. 
and therefore I'm going to end it and I'll see you next time.